and welcome to Untold Hong Kong Stories, multimedia narratives from the margins. This is a podcast series where we hear the stories of people in our community, from Hong Kong's non-Chinese locals to marginalized members of our community. We hope that by sharing their stories, we can think about the way we live ours and create a more inclusive and diverse society. I'm Emily from the Department of English Language and Literature of Hong Kong Baptist University, and our guests for today's podcast are Dawit, a youth worker and educator, focusing on social and environmental justice, and Justin, an MPH candidate at the University of Hong Kong, who is also a sex educator. I'm Justin. I'm currently, I am still student at XKU. Aside from my research, which is related to sex toy and obscenity,、um, I'm also a sex educator in、um, Sikhi Rights Club, a registered charity that does sex education、um, predominantly for youth. So, so my technical title is curator of public programs and education. So I'll deal with、um, public programs for women for, from the age of sixteen to twenty-seven. So it's a one-year online program. Some of them, we, we, of course, we will do、um, physical events, say for example yoga, as well as、um, body exploration. That kind of stuff will be online. And the other side will be focusing on micro domestic worker sexual health. So we'll be、um, we have been collaborating with um, um, NGOs like Pathfinders、um, to talk about、um, to eliminate、um, taboo within the micro domestic worker community when they talk about sex, as well as、um, we were, tr- were going to have another podcast, in fact, on、um, enlightening or to change the idea of、um, sexual taboo、um, within the micro domestic workers community regarding sexual health as well as other sexual taboos. So yeah. In in short, I'm a sex educator,、mm. and I do things all about sex, and、um, I try to make things fun. I guess、okay. yes, that's really fascinating. I think that's a really rich、um, profile that you're talking about. So it's just to clarify a little bit. So you 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 were born and raised in Hong Kong, am I correct? Yes, great. So locally born and <laughs> yes, ah,、uh... Hong Kong. So David, would you like to tell us a little bit about you?、Uh, well? Yeah. So thank you first for for having us over here. And、uh, my name is Dawit, and、uh, I am an Eritrean, which is、uh, a country in the eastern part of Africa.、Mm-hmm. I was born there, raised there, and I've worked for most of my life there. But I've also lived and worked in different African countries,、uh, visited like、uh, more than eight African countries as well、mm-hmm. uh, before I came to Hong Kong、uh, to study、uh, to do my master's in education.、Uh, I started as an educator back.、Uh, When I graduated university in Eritrea, but then I've also worked in different industries,、mm-hmm. mainly on、uh, manufacturing of、mm-hmm. medical devices. But、uh, I was always passionate about、uh, education, and that's why I went back again to do a master's in education here in Hong Kong. And then after that, I start、uh, actually while I was studying, I start working and get involved with the Africa Center Hong Kong,、mm-hmm. uh, which has started actually its、uh, its space in 2020. And、uh, the mission of、uh, Africa Center is of rebranding blackness,、uh, black consciousness, and also connecting、uh, and creating bridges between the different communities in Hong Kong. It is in twenty、uh, twenty when I when I was still actually in 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 HKU that I, I got introduced to Innocent, founder of Africa Center Hong Kong, and then he was st- establishing center. Uh, which works on、uh, rebranding blackness and also like、uh, introducing black consciousness in Hong Kong, and also of course creating a bridge between the different communities here in、mm-hmm. Hong Kong. So this was something that really re- resonated with me, and I started to get involved there, especially in producing different educational、mm-hmm. uh, programs, uh, of course、uh, to promote and also to introduce、uh, African culture, black history, because、uh, there was this lack of consciousness that we.、Uh, We found out in Hong Kong, and also like me as an educator, even when I was still a student, researching on、uh, and comparing different educational systems between Hong Kong and other countries,、uh, I've realized that a lot of people do not know about、uh, about Africa in general, and also about Black history.、Uh, so there was a need,、mm-hmm. and、uh, I immediately said okay, and then start to get involved the center and building different programs. And then after that, of course, I, I also work in Poly U. Uh, service learning as well.、Mm. 
And that's how I got to know you. I, I mean, as Jennifer Keller Center as well. Yeah, yeah. So for um, audience information, Innocent was actually also interviewed in our very first uh, series um, uh, of the of the video cast that is um, actually available on YouTube. So if you're interested, do go ahead and, and have, a, have a listen. Yeah, so going back to our um, episode today, so I think it might uh, become apparent to our audiences that what is the theme that we're looking at today is actually education, right? So which is a really important thing that we, um, I think in Hong Kong and over the world as well. So obviously both of you are educators, right? And um, I'm curious what brought you to education in the very first place. So you talk about, you know, how you involved it in what you're working currently, but at the very beginning, why are you interested in working in the field of education? I think that we have to go, I have to go back to the, the point that when I was studying an associate degree, because that was the first time I know that doing stuff in gender and sexuality is something that could make you money. <laughs> or, or as in a fact, like, yeah, 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 I'm not kidding. Like, because, like, I found out what cultural study is. And then, in fact, I'm quite prudish when I was a secondary school kid. When I hear about my one of my closest friend who um, lose his virginity in secondary school um, two, and I was godsmacked. And I was like, ah, cannot it's so scary but but when i go to um second uh, um like um, associate degree when i study media cultural studies i found out that oh like all those like theories judy butler this and that and then later on like i have i, I read more i research more and then i build up my entire repertoire of um theories understanding of sexuality and how to research in an anthropological sense and then later on i know that like i i need to do something to teach um, other kids who who may be like us or uh, um, who are lost in the in a vacuum regarding like um, sexual stuff or maybe they are currently curious about their own sex and sexuality and then maybe because of their curiosity that people might manipulate that I have my own experience regarding like being manipulated gaslighted in relationship as well so I do more research on that so in my own um, teaching um, I, I would incorporate this kind of like theories into um, especially for secondary school kids actually so yeah the reason why I got into this is that like um, I just love talking to people I want to um, you know mend the wrong that the society has done to us um, a, a systematic issue that we have been able to address since 1997 because the sex education guideline was um, established in 1997 but haven't been um, amended since. What I, I want to do is to stop being a bystander and try to educate what is the current situation in Hong Kong, what are the real life of people in um, the LGBT communities or even with so-called deviant sexual behaviours. Mm-hmm. Most of the bashing or gay bashing or, or discrimination is come from ignorance. Um, the, there is a word in academia which is part of my research is called anthropology. So it res- uh, or the philosophy of um, culturally induced ignorance. My education philosophy or, or my pedagogy is to tackle this problem and try to bridge the gap between the uh, different knowledge. And I want to bridge the gap of knowledge that most people have and try to eliminate that kind of like, you know, discrimination, stigma, all this kind of stuff. That sounds really... Broad. That sounds like, yeah, that's, not, that's a big quote, but then that's almost like a call to me because um, it sounds like, you know, you, you have, this is something that's in, instinctive, that is something that you're important, you're born with, um, with this kind of compassion, with this kind of critical eyes and also this kind of um, ability to stand in other people's um, shoes in order to look at, you know, what they're facing and to get them prepared for that. So wait, is that something that you see from your from your work before coming to Hong Kong or after coming to Hong Kong as well? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's very similar in many ways. Because uh, for me also, like uh, it's after traveling in different countries that actually I started also getting my passion back in education, and then that's when I wanted to have my masters here in Hong Kong. And uh, because like I do talk to people whenever I go, whenever I travel, and Many people are like not happy with the current situation in our planet, whatever it go. Mm-hmm. And uh, people want to change that. And I think education is one of the best way because like income inequality is uh, very high uh, in different societies. Uh, there is discrimination and there are a lot of marginalized people. Uh, 
slave, sorry, uh, mm, like because of what happened to black people and mm-hmm. enslavement and also colonization, uh, racism still exists in different countries. And uh, the planet, our planet, is not healthy for what mm-hmm. for what we did. The, mm-hmm. uh, uh, we abused the ecosystem. So uh, everything is not, uh, is not right, uh, especially coming from countries that are still trying to develop and uh, you you see this uh, uh, very uh, very clearly and uh, education mm-hmm. like he said is one way to bring this to light and to change some hearts to change some minds of course some people will, will resist and you need that deep learning around that line and also for many people who have been colonized as well we need to decolonize our minds that's why we promote like uh, black consciousness uh, we need to be aware of the things that we've been told which is not right and it's up to us uh, to do that because many things have been are learned all these negative things uh, all this imagination about ourselves especially for people of color uh, we need to change that and i think education plays a huge role and that's why also i tend to work in that area your, your sharing, I think, reminds me a lot of the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals. Right? Yeah, I think in, in many ways, uh, we're trying to work towards that. But um, I think many people, you know, of course, NGOs, you know, we take a lot of uh, work in that and, and governments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think what would really fundamentally change people's mind um, would be education, obviously. Sure. And, and I think that would be something that's shared, um, you know, between um, both of you as well. And... Um, I'm also thinking about um, decolonizing um, mm. the mind, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, the Gugi is, you know, very, you know, very famous um, line of, you know, talking about, you know, English, mm. you know, uh, British imperialism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're not going that way. But yeah. I'm just thinking. Um, I think a lot of uh, what I when I hear, you know, um, what you have said and our previous conversations, and um, I, I, I think what is really interesting. And also the very reason why I, I invite both of you here today is that I think both of you aspire to undo something mm. in individuals. Um, and that undoing could be, could actually could be quite difficult. I mean, um, you know, as a, also as a, as a person born and raised here, yeah, I think mm. there are lots of things that I would like to undo and educate myself and mm. then, you know, accept something new, but that's actually quite difficult. So I'm just wondering, um, Hong Kong is also a, you know, um, trilingual or multilingual, um, mm. um, um, city. In terms of language, um, is that something that, um, would catch your attention when you're teaching? Because obviously both of you speak, you know, different languages. Mm. So, I'm just wondering what, um, you know, what languages do you use, you know, as an individual, what mm. languages do you use when you teach? And do you have any preference or are you asked it to have any preference uh, when you teach certain groups of students? Yeah. Oh, actually, I just did one of my first uh, Mandarin sex education sessions like a couple of weeks ago, mm. like in a, in a local secondary school. Originally, it plans to be a full English session as it was a, a international school, but because some of the students actually not born and raised here or they haven't been um, in the international school system for a very long time, they actually come from mainland China or mm-hmm. other parts of the town. Um, most of them don't really understand English that well even. Uh, not to speak like the, the, the like terms related to sex and sexuality so uh, in that sense I have to like shift my mind into like doing Mandarin I'm thinking about like Mandarin things regarding like the human <laughs> anatomy and then the diseases and it, it was quite an experience and the terms you're using are really <clears throat> specific and, and formal yeah 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 I mean like I, I try I, I have to try like thinking like whether because like you know Mandarin it's a relatively written language like uh, it's more or less the same in terms of written and the spoken language and that's why it's easier for me to convert um, regarding say like certain diseases and so on but yet the pronunciation is a problem but like if you if, if going back to the question regarding like um, teaching different language because um, for for sticky rice love um, my I my um, usual task is to deal with um, international sessions, so I will usually deliver the English sessions, which I don't usually deliver the Chinese ones simply because I don't want to deal with um, teachers that are not as um, you know open 
Like I don't want to go into confrontation mode. But actually, like later on, like I've been to different schools, and sometimes like most of them, most of the teachers are in fact um, local teachers. Even in the international sessions, I was like, okay, sure, um, I I might want to try. But uh, for in terms of teaching in Cantonese, I usually teach Cantonese when or, or to to do outreach um, in Cantonese. Um, say um, for the women's um, activities that I just mentioned, as well as other outreach events regarding sexual pleasures, mm-hmm. then I will usually speak in Cantonese. Um, but in um, in terms of in high school, um, I usually or, or even in primary school, I, I teach primary school as well. In terms of um, like body boundaries, the, the you know the traffic lights of or this we cannot touch, we cannot touch a breast area, this kind of stuff. Then we we have to teach like you know like there is some video on 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 kids channel like on YouTube. I have to like, you know I have to get the all those reference and uh, get the attention. Then mm-hmm. I, I I look like those like oh can I name Blue's Clue? Uh? I don't know whether you heard of it. Blue school is like, oh, kids, where is your, uh, 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 like, <laughs> this area? Like, can I say, I say penis here? Yeah, okay, good, sure. good, 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 yeah. great. So where is this? Uh, actually, in fact, I, I have I have a full slide of the human, uh, like like a cartoon version of the human anatomy. And then and then a, a cartoon version. So I'll, I'll ask usually like primary school one to two, um, I've P1 to P2 kids to like, you know, speak it out loud with me like penis vagina we have to speak it out loud and then the kids won't it's not a problem the teachers are so teachers in will english. in english okay. so so the teachers will be ah blush la, and then and then but the kids are fine because like some of them knows that these are like forbidden words that they cannot speak it out loud but i have to tell them that okay in this space and time with my presence i give you the authority <laughs> all right so in my in my classroom, there is no limits regarding language. If you dare ask the question, I'll have an answer for you. Most of the time, it's like that. I don't sometimes like in terms of like you, the language use. Of course, I have to tune down my language. I I could be more, um, you know, crude yeah. when I'm teaching um, um, adults because like sometimes they need that kind of crudeness crudeness in order to loosen it up. But for kids, I think uh, of course like sometimes. The word of the word stupid is already too much for them, so so I have to be very sensitive in terms of my language use. As but especially as a um, non-native speaker, sometimes like when I, I adopt into speaking English in in a more casual manner, it's really hard to go back to a point that um, that language. Or, or in fact, like my language is made particularly for pro, um, academic use. Yeah. So it is really hard for me to speak to kids like primary school one to two in 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 language that is easy for them to understand. Mm. Sometimes I'll go to oh academic terms, okay, or even like or, or even like really hard language English le- words, and and I'll say I have to I have to like you know like dilute it down like to to explain to them. So that would be the pl- the, the hard part. But in terms of like speaking about taboo, both language have their own problems, and and it's just that like. Um, but the thing is, like, if I talk in speak in English, or or the most of them, the English audience, they are more open than to Cantonese speaking audience. I, 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 that's what I observe at least. That's very interesting because I think you're on one hand you're talking about you know the different personas that you're taking the, the different kind of dictionary you're using when you're talking to different um, students, and on the other hand you're also speaking about the fact that you also use this kind of language differences to empower them. Um, for often in English, that is there's something that's not so close to them. I mean, imagine saying penis or vagina in, in Cantonese; yeah, that would be yeah. even harder, I imagine. And um, is that something that echoes Chloe's um, experience as well? Because uh, is uh, your native um, language is is not like English as well? Yeah, true, true. Yeah. I mean, English is my uh, my second language, and, mm-hmm. and the same as everybody in Hong Kong, I guess most people yeah. in Hong Kong, and uh, you can relate to. I can relate with what he, what he was saying, and uh, yeah, sometimes it's not it's not easy, uh, uh, especially like we, also like I I do work like with young kids and sometimes with uh, old university kids like students as well, and uh, you 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 have to to leave certain 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 things certain words because they're like it would be too big to uh, for the students to comprehend. Uh, so, so like okay they, they might ask me for example okay we need the students to learn a little bit about Africa today would you please come and, and 
yeah, well, you have one hour or 90 minutes. And then these mm. kids have never heard about colonization. Mm. Never, they have no understanding of why uh, they think, like, for example, Jamaica is in Africa. If I ask them, they would definitely say it's in Africa, but which is which is not true. Yeah. And it would be very hard to explain to all this uh, uh, historical background, which is very important because that's what shaped uh, the current uh, uh, African countries and the current social social structure of uh, our African people. So it played a huge, a huge role. So it's very you don't feel comfortable leaving that part out, but it w- it would not be right as well to to bring those words because like i said they miss that in their textbook so uh you want to use certain uh, uh certain elements like maybe a game or a cow or something to to help them understand the relationship among like for example african people living in africa and also the afro diaspora because it would be very hard to to bring all this stuff at the same time and it's like in a very short period of time uh it would not be right, especially for 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 young kids. But for the older kid, for the older uh, students, it's easier. But also over there, you need also to to be careful not to 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 propagate certain stereotypes that they might have. So mm-hmm. you also need to be very much be careful, especially when you're talking about uh, about the history of colonization, the history of black people. Uh, some people do have their uh, their prejudices and their stereotypes. So creating an environment where they can speak freely, uh, ask questions, what they, whatever questions they want to ask, you want them to ask, mm-hmm. so that you can you can talk to them uh, and ease their mind and then build their understanding. But also you don't want to propagate certain mm-hmm. uh, stereotypes. So you'll be challenged in that part. I've been challenged in that part. So you have always to be careful on your, on your language. And the other part is also, of course, language is changing every, every day mm-hmm. and trying to use like inclusive language so I still have to build myself and learn mm-hmm. myself because every time it's changing and uh, we have to be very inclusive in the way we speak and how we interact with students as well. Yeah, I think that's really fascinating because I, I echo that as well. I mean as a, a non-native English speaker I think very often when we when we speak just like what Justin was saying uh, when we speak in English we are Adopting and other mm. personality to some extent, and right. it's very important to not to you know betray to some extent who you are indeed, right. and because um, you know, um, when you you know shifting towards the other dimension too much, then that might be the case. Because the, the thing is that the hardest part is like many of the books that describe us mm. generally mm. are written by other people who's yeah. trying to change. So using their words, <laughs> using yeah. their ideology, using their lens. Uh, to explain uh, our experiences is not right, mm. yeah. but we're still using that language. So we have we we have to find that uh, that middle ground where we are really really sharing our experiences, our livelihood to to other people, but also not trying to use their lens, which they have used to to portray That's... to portray us negatively. Mm. That's almost as like a logical fallacy that you need to keep looping that right. um, mm-hmm. logical um, kind of thing. But um, that's, I mean, that's also exactly that what makes, you know, you doing um, and the Africa Center doing so impressive because you're using, you as mentioned, you, it is not something, this is something they're going to talk about in other questions later, but you are not in the mainstream sort of education, so to speak, but still you're able, still able to do that. So that's really um that's really something, and 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 for me as a as a as a you know person who've been to Africa Center lots of time and also pushing my students to go there mm-hmm. uh, as often as they could be. I think I think uh, apart from games and and books, um, music and and the food, of course, mm-hmm. is also something that would really be the language um, mm-hmm. that you use to to talk to the people in, to really um, start this kind of genuine cultural. Mm-hmm. Exchanges and mm. just like what you're, what Jari is saying, um, pushing them to you know, ask yeah. questions. I think that would be something that is um, very much like you know saying penis and, and vagina right. out loud. Mm. I think something that I could add on upon David's um, comment would be the idea of literacy. In fact, mm. so like this language is one thing, but how to read or liter- have the literacy or have the 
you know, the Rolodex of language that is usable in in a certain context. In say, for example, in terms of race, in terms of sex, or even for us, like even for us sex educator, we have to constantly update our own cultural literacy、mm-hmm. because, like,、um, as I mentioned beforehand, I am currently working with migrant domestic workers as well as other、um, ethnic minority. No, I, I, I prefer to use non-Chinese Hong Kongers. Like, if I'm、yes. usually, okay, so、um, communities in Hong Kong. So the thing is.、Um, I have to, in in not only about the language that they use. Like for example, like I have to learn some like Indonesian language words regarding that Filipino words. I have to know their own context as well in order to situate them their 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 understanding in order to make them understand. Uh, uh, in, in in their own language,、mm-hmm. because their their literacy in terms of sex sexuality might not、uh, might be、um, influenced by religions or even cultural other cultural means. So I for now like I I even I I, I force myself to do more research on um if uh, um laws related to、um, is Islam law regarding like、um, marriage marital rights and all this kind of stuff simply to let them know that okay. Um, this is that, and then whether I have the literacy or the language to talk to them in tr- in in their own context is important because, like,、um, for for a person like like a you know like a Chinese person in Hong Kong, like I, I I have all the context I need for teaching Hong Kong kids, but the language regarding say for example as you mentioned the coloniality maybe I have to talk about this. What I can use to say, I, I can do talk about this to local kids, no problem. Because like I'll tell them about like the decriminalization of、um, sodomy law, which is related to colonialism. But whether I can talk about this,、um, more or less the same, con-、um, using the context of other people,、um, people from other cultures, even other countries, is completely different.、Mm. So like for for us educator, it's as you mentioned, we have to keep on updating our own. Repertoire and 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 words regarding uh, uh, languages languages used as well as、um, how could we incorporate or to update our own pedagogies and teaching materials because we don't want to um uh, 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 let, let me rephrase I think we should right the wrong、mm. that people have done、mm. especially. Those who written their texts in a relatively colonial or even Orientalist mentality. So we have to write our own history and write our own teaching material to teach the kids that okay, these are the things that people are literally encountering, and then these are the realities. Although there are multiple realities from different people's point of view, but we are just telling them these are the things that are relatively objective. Or we are, tr- or for us, sex educator, what we are trying to do is to do harm reduction. At the end of the day, we just want you to know what your right is and what your,、uh, um, what you can do when you need to seek help, for example. So I don't know, like literacy regarding like different cultures, sexuality,、mm. anything. It's important in this day and age regarding education. And I think what Justin you touched on just now is actually how. Language empowers a, a person.、Um, specifically, language rele- relevance to the field that you you, you work in, sex education, and, and for that we、um, how blacklists have been understood and should be understood、mm-hmm. um, in Hong Kong and afar. So, but these are actually very niche area. Allow、uh. me to put it this way. This is a kind of edgy、um, kind of mentality.、Um, do you consider yourself as a minority in Hong Kong、um, as a person? Mm-hmm. Uh, your individual identity and also as a as a teacher. Maybe that we you you were the first. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean legally, I'm considered part of the、uh, ethnic minority in Hong Kong,、mm-hmm. and uh, culturally, uh, I'm very close with them. We work close with them, and the type of education that I do, especially intercultural learning as well, is、uh, basically. Uh, bringing this、uh, ethnic minority culture to、mm-hmm. to the mainstream、mm-hmm. uh, in Hong Kong, so you need students to understand, and yeah, and they have to bring、uh, your your own brothers and sisters to engage、uh, with the students, and then create an environment, create a space where they can exchange their culture, their tradition, their language、uh, in different ways, in different forms, and、uh, yeah, and what I do, who am I? Is of course part of uh, uh, the ethnic minority、mm. in Hong Kong, 
And but to add to to the language part, usually like you also highlighted, it's uh, uh, especially when it comes to intercultural learning, cultural sensitivity. You, it's usually creating an experience because mm. l- language by itself would not be enough. So when when people do experience other people's culture, could be the food, could be the dance, uh, could be the job, <laughs> could be anything uh, uh, that you you're learning from that other person. We, when you create that environment, then people really experience that. And sometimes you don't even need mm. to speak. It could be through sort of drawing. It could be through sort of, sort of drama. So there are many, many ways where you can share your culture, your tradition. And it depends on on the space that you create. And that experience really, really uh, stays with you more than the words that you that's You've brilliant. had around that mm. time. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant because I think what you're saying is actually the fact that with the experiences that they have, they're actually creating their own task book, like, right? mm. Cre- yeah. creating their own very own um, um, uh, knowledge that they that would linger with them and then would read something even greater. True, true. Yeah. And right. Like, um, because we are living in, in such um, intersectional age it's really hard to define what minority is in a sense that like whether our social status actually become makes us less of a minority but you know in other status like say our sexuality or what we do could become you know like useful in, to, in, in this eight day and age because um, for, for I, I don't know like these for now like being niche could be something that is um Popular, should I use mm. this word? Like being niche is have, have its own niche market. Let's just put it this way: <laughs> being niche have your own niche market, and then when the market is small, then if you dominate the market, then you know, like you can you can have your voice heard because people will find you to uh, um, speak on certain things or certain uh, on behalf on certain issues. Think and, and and I think like simply because we are put into a more socially like um marginalized um mm. placement that actually makes us more powerful in a mm. sense that we have more space uh, we, do, we we have people are more inclu- uh, um um uh, uh, willing to give us space to to speak our truth and then we because they see that oh this is not so much to- to, um sp- I'm talking about um this is not a popular topic that's why what you guys are doing are um in fact important the thing that it is because we are niche that actually bring us a lot of like opportunities mm-hmm. and people invited us to talk on certain issues or to you know help with changing certain um, education because but we uh, for for Sticky Rise Up we do um, teachers workshops as well they invite us because we are the few that do sex education in Hong Kong so somehow I think like the so called minority being niche somehow could be beneficial. But at the same time, it is re- relatively hard to let the say the institution, governmental bodies, to listen to us simply because they don't. They always say that we don't have the mandate to support it. So in that sense, we are the minor- minority. But at the same time, can we survive or can, do we have a voice? Yes, we do have a voice. That's very uplifting, honestly. Because yes, I uh, think, um, yeah, of course. <laughs> and I, and I think what you have pointed out just now is that. Um, being so-called minority, um, quote unquote, could be something that gives you a, 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 a good perspective and a kind of um, good position that allows you to to undo certain things. Yeah. Right? So that's also what sits at the core of um, both of you as teacher. And um, this episode is going to end at this point, but uh, we're going to dig much deeper into your uh, teaching, into your education in the next episode. So um, thank you so much for listening and we will have you back in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.